Now, just as a general reminder, um, while the academic learning lecture are being posted online, if you've ever actually watched some of those re lecture recordings, they're kind of crappy, right? I move around too much and kind of playing stuff on the screen. Um, and it's just the nature kind of recording here kind of sucks. I don't have like a nice recording studio or anything like that here. So just expect that if you're trying to rely on that, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to hear things. And you're just going to miss some of the like, details that I have. So keep that in mind. Uh, as always, two slides with you on Sunday. So if you have any issues with computers or anything like that, let me know ahead of time as much as possible. Um, just because if I don't see an email until 11 59, I can't guarantee that I'll answer it. So uh, just for a general reminder, like if you send me an email and then it's after like five o'clock, especially on Friday, good luck. Uh, there's going to be a little chance that I'm going to see it until probably the next day or two after. So if you have an emergency and you let me know something, you can try to put that in like during regular business hours. No, that's not like that. Um, don't forget that connecting with my own email is due on Monday. Uh, I've got a lot of questions about this, so I kind of want to like reiterate a couple things real quick. Um, first and foremost, 500 characters, not 500 words. The big point with this whole assignment, right, is that you're supposed to be making this boring kind of stick in the mud between those and communicating to an audience that is much of a general audience, right? You're trying to turn it into something that isn't the same boring abstract that you've read. You're trying to actually captivate you know, people, tell you the true story of this cool nature that happens, right? You know, and it shouldn't scare you that all of these frogs are dying off from some random action to come up to come out for um, a lot of them, are, or that you know, remnants aren't really a thing, right? Those are interesting questions that are have profound effects for how we handle things from either a momentum perspective or just a general momentum perspective, but then some of them matter. And you know, try to have some fun with it. I put you all like put pictures in. Don't just copy the keyword for your hashtag and actually like come up with stuff on your own with something fun. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just giving it a little bit of energy. Is that really multiple business? Yeah. 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 This ain't gonna work. Yeah, fuck that. Um, <laughs> it only works so well, right? Um, but yeah, just keep that in mind. The whole point is to. Get away from the boring, stodgy, shitty scientific journal writing and turning it into something that you would actually want to read on Twitter or TikTok or something and inform people of something that you don't know it or that most people have no clue about, right? So, and again, remember, you don't have to post it. If you want to, that's great, but don't feel like you have to. All right. Also, don't forget that exam two is coming up. I think it's two weeks from Friday or two weeks from today. So that is kind of coming up quickly. Make sure you're studying, especially spending time with um, particularly like just sitting down and learning these vocabulary words. It's gonna be kind of a pain, expect that. So if you start now and kind of are on top of things, it's not gonna be 400 words that you're gonna have to memorize. It'll be closer to like 50 that you, have, you already, that you need to memorize before the exam and 150 that you already know kind of thing. Um, one thing that I also want to mention is that the day before the exam, we will do, or like the class day before an exam, we'll do a review in here. So come in here with questions based off of how you did your quizzes and all that kind of fun stuff. And we'll just go through them. And that's all we're going to do that day is kind of go through the quizzes and all that kind of fun stuff. And if anything, if we have some extra time, maybe I can see if people want me to, I can show off some of what y'all did for the connecting with biology stuff. I'll, I'll ask you beforehand if, if uh, that's okay. I'm not going to just throw your stuff up on the screen, but there's been some fun TikToks and stuff, stuff that people have done. I kind of want to showcase those and like show people like what cool stuff y'all are doing. So anyways, so let's go ahead and get into the lecture for today. Um, like most of my Friday lectures, I try to keep them somewhat short. So if you have questions, we can chat right at the end. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the muscular and the skeletal systems. And we're going to talk about these two things together because they're often incredibly interrelated and you really can't have one functioning easily without the other, at least in vertebrates. Um, outside of vertebrates, obviously, uh, skeletal systems in particular are very, very different. 
but from a human centric perspective, pretty much how we exist, right? You need to have something for that muscle to attach to to move things around. Now, muscles ultimately, like I just mentioned, have to interact with the skeleton, right? The muscular system and the skeleton system or skeletal system all work together. So the muscular system is going to provide that motion. It's going to be it's actually moving you around. And that's all done based off of these muscle cells contracting, which is going to be stimulated by the nervous system. So you've got that nervous system backbone here that's controlling everything, right? But the skeletal system is going to be there to add firm structure and support that's going to help keep not only you being able to stand and do all that kind of fun stuff, because if you just had muscle per se, it's not going to quite work as well. Um, but it's also going to be there for something that the muscle can attach to and pull against. So that way it'll move a lot more dramatically. It'll actually be able to kind of function properly. Now, skeletons can take many forms. So in humans and most vertebrates, we have something called an endoskeleton, which you can see kind of an example of that here on this bony fish, where it's got all of those skeletal pieces that are inside of the body and it's able to bind all of those muscles to it from in, in, internally. But there's also other cool examples, things like crabs and a lot of other invertebrates are going to have something called an exoskeleton, which is why if you've ever seen um, crabs do this, spiders do this, a bunch of other things, lobsters, um, in order for them to continue growing, they have to do something called molting, which is where they'll actually dissociate from their current external skeleton, start growing a new one underneath, come out of that exoskeleton and then finish that hardening process for the new exoskeleton. Because ultimately that exoskeleton is gonna limit their growth potential. So you have to basically shed and create a new one every, depending on how quickly you're growing, anywhere between a couple of days to years, it just kind of depends. But then there's also some really funky ones out there like hydrostatic skeletons, which is basically these gelatinous, water-filled specialized cells that are there to give structure to things like jellyfish or other hydros, corals, that sort of thing. But it's a lot more fluid and flexible, which is a lot more advantageous for a particular kind of environment, right? Something like these jellyfish, it's a lot better for them to have that more fluid structure so they can move a little bit easier through their environment than something like a crab or a fish. Now this hydrostatic skeleton is the simplest type of skeleton. It's the one that exists probably at the, that very early part of animals first branching off. And it consists of that fluid constrained within a layer of flexible tissue, like I mentioned. Now arthropods and mollusks are going to have that exoskeleton like you talked about. So arthropods are anything like um, crabs, insects, spiders, millipedes, centipedes, all that kind of fun stuff. Basically anything that has that like lots of legs kind of coming up from a central body plan. Uh, whereas mollusks are anything like um, a lot of squids, uh, which they're kind of a funky, they're, they're kind of their own thing when it comes to having that exoskeleton, but um, a lot of bivalves, things like oysters, clams, that kind of stuff. And animals with these exoskeletons are going to have to periodically molt them since that exoskeleton does not grow with that, the rest of the body. And finally, the endoskeleton, which is what we have, each vertebrate species has a distinct skeleton, but all are composed of the same type of cells that have similar arrangements. For instance, I feel like this is one of the classic facts that if you've ever been to a zoo before, you've probably heard, but the number of vertebra in your neck is the exact same as a giraffe, as well as a little tiny mouse. They all three have seven vertebrae. It's just all scaled differently and designed just slightly differently to be able to, to support and handle all those different structures. For instance, if you ever look at the vertebra for a giraffe, they're about that long, about that thick around, and they have these processes that come on on the outside of them that are there so that way they can have a little bit of extra muscle attachment and be able to be able to support that head that's going to be 10 to 15 feet off the ground. Whereas in humans, ours are pretty boring. They're just kind of little circular things about that wide, about that tall. And they're literally just there to keep your head you know, on top of your neck, as well as to protect your spinal cord. So those purposes kind of differ depending on what kind of function you need that neck or anything else really to serve, right? Um, a really cool example of this 
is if you think about the hand of your hand, right? Bats, dolphins, uh, big cats, a lot of other organisms all have this exact same hand design that we do. And it's because we all came from the same basic lineage of mammals, right? We're all five-fingered and five-toed. Now, some of those might've gotten lost in the process, but if you were to take an X-ray of a dolphin's hand, it looks exactly like ours. If you were to take an X-ray of a bat's hand that's holding up, it's just gonna have a couple of extra long fingers that are there to kind of support that structure that is their wings. And we'll show that a lot more in detail later. So quick review question here. So this graph below depicts the growth of an animal over time. What sort of skeleton do you think this animal probably has? What about A, B, or C? So given that you've got these really sporadic, quick events where they're growing their size very quickly, and then it levels up for a bit, and then it grows really quickly again, and then it levels out a bit, it's most likely not an endoskeleton, right? Because your endoskeleton is always going to be internal and it's always going to be kind of growing with the rest of your body. And the same goes for something like a hypostatic skeleton, where it's again kind of growing with the rest of your body. But an exoskeleton that you're going to have to molt periodically, like we've mentioned a couple times now, is going to be something that you're going to have to dispose of, grow really big again, dispose of it, grow really big again. So that's why you would see that shape, that stair step line when you're. Increasing your body fat really quickly and it levels up. Increasing it again, levels up that kind of Does that make sense? Now, several different types of tissue make up the skeletal system. Obviously, like all you know, organ systems, you have the three primary different types of you know, tissue types. Then we'll have connective tissue, which in this case makes up things like bones, cartilage, tendons, ligaments, the marrow of the vertebrate skeleton. So that's all the stuff on the internal part of your bone. Uh, for muscle, obviously, you've got the skeletal muscle that's going to connect to the movable bones, as well as enabling voluntary movements. And then finally, you've got that nervous uh, component, which is going to be there to sense body position and control where the muscles are going to go. Now, ultimately, all three of these things have to be closely intertwined, both structurally and functionally, for these things to work in the first place. You need all of these different kinds of tissues to make up parts of your skeleton and parts of your muscles. Now the bones are considered the organ of that vertebrate skeleton. The bones are grouped uh, into a two different categories. You have the axial skeleton, which is going to surround and support the central axis of the body. And then you're going to have the appendicular, appendicular skeleton, which consists of the appendages and the bones that support them. So in other words, your axial skeleton is going to be all the stuff that's kind of in your core of your body, your ribs, your sternum, uh, any of your backbone, uh, parts of your hip, the center portion there. Hold your head, your neck, that kind of thing. However, that appendicular skeleton is going to be any of your legs, your arms, and so kind of like this outer portion of your hip here where it connects away from the rest of the body. Uh, all that kind of fun stuff is fair game as far as appendicular. Now, this axial part of the skeleton is going to be there to shield parts of the body, particularly the soft parts of the body, so that way they're not damaged if you're, you know, just trying to exist, right? Um, so for instance, the skull could be there to protect the brain, as well as to provide some protection to the sense organs, so your tongue, um, the internal parts of your nostrils, all that kind of stuff, your ears, all of that stuff's gonna be protected inside of the base of your skull so it doesn't get easily damaged. As well as things like the ribs, which are there to protect the heart and lungs. So for instance, you're much less likely to suffer you know, major impact damage if you fall, um, unless you, you know, break a rib enough that it pokes into your lungs, which is kind of counterproductive, but yeah, that, that's primarily what they're there for. As well as they help to protect things like the liver, the stomach, and all that kind of stuff, which is important too. And finally, you get the vertebra, which are there to probably protect one of the most critical parts of your body, the spinal cord. Because if your body can't inter interface with your spinal cord in particular spots, you're not going to be able to move correctly. You're not going to be able to process food in certain places. It all kind of gets really bad really quickly. And for instance, if you've ever heard or watched the show, say like Friday Night Lights, where you have somebody that goes through a spinal injury, they often mention things like a C5 vertebra split or a C7 vertebra split. What that means is they're talking about where in the spinal column you have a break. Because that matters tremendously. Because if you break it way up top, right up near the base of the head, 
can probably die instantly because you can't communicate with your all of your internal organs, including everything from the lung to everything like that. As well as you're not going to be able to move. However, depending on where you break things, particularly if it's in say the lower part of your back, it may only influence the nerves that are going down to your lower legs. So you'll still have major ramifications for that damage, but it's probably not going to kill you. You're just going to have a very rough life, more than likely after that. And you can, through therapy, particularly uh, with some of the regenerative uh, techniques that we're trying with stem cells and things like that, can develop some of those nerve connections back, but it's extremely difficult. Now, when it comes to the appendicular skeleton, it's going to consist primarily of the limbs, which includes both the pectoral girdles and the pelvic girdles. The pectoral girdle is going to be there for connecting the forelimbs to the axial skeleton. And of course, as, you know, you've got your forelimb bones that make it a part of that too. And then you have your pelvic girdle, which is there to attach your hind limbs to the axial skeleton. And these all kind of are things that you can see in a ton of different mammals as well. Um, and the kind of the way they're shaped and how they function are very different depending on um, everything from whether you're biologically a male or female or what species you are, all that kind of fun stuff. In fact, um, I came out of a forestry and wildlife program and one of my classes, we literally had to be able to look at a uh, pelvic bone that came out of a deer and be able to sex it, as well as determine what age it is, just based off of the kind of processes that exist on the outside of the hip bone, as well as this overall shape. And it's a pretty easy thing to determine, especially with mammals. If more often than not, the birth canal will run in between part of the pelvis. So for biological females, it's usually a lot wider. And you can see that pretty red, readily in things like deer and humans. So there's some things to think about. Now, the vertebrate skeleton features that central backbone that we keep on mentioning, that vertebral column supports and protects that spinal cord, and the ribs, which are there to protect the heart and lungs, are going to attach to that vertebrate column. And that vertebral column does curve to the side um, occasionally. And this is one of the reasons why, when y'all were in middle school, they checked the actual curvature of your spine. And the reason for that is if it's really off center. Uh, not only is it going to kind of affect how you grow, it can lead to major issues. But scoliosis in particular, um, if it's really bad, it can also hinder how your internal organs sit inside of your body cavity. It can cause a lot of issues as well, depending on how bad the case is. Now, bones can have a lot of different functions other than just being there for structural support. So bones are going to be there connected to muscles, obviously, to provide movement, right? But bones are also there to supply minerals. Remember back to the endocrine system, we were talking about that calcitonin that can pull or remove uh, calcium from the bones to release back into the bloodstream. It's a great way to store this kind of stuff, right? As well as things like phosphorus are very similar in that regard, too. Then probably one of the most important functions that um, all these limb bones are going to have, especially with this marrow, is going to serve the uh, purpose of creating blood cells, both red blood cells and white blood cells. So not only are you helping with the respiratory and the circulatory parts of your body just by having these bones, right? You're helping the immune system too. So it's all these things that are working together. So remember, everything kind of doesn't quite fit distinctly into distinct categories when you're talking about organ systems. Now, bones in particular are porous rather than just being solid bone matter, right? They're going to have little holes in them. And there's a lot of different reasons why you might have that. Specifically, um, for instance, when you're talking about things like birds, they're going to have a lot more of these holes inside of those bones. So that way they're not only lighter, but you can actually form specialized structures where it's almost more like uh, if you've ever, say, for instance, looked at the outside of Spaceship Earth, right? Where it's got all the Epcot, the big golf ball. It's got all those triangles, right? Birds have a very similar structure inside of their bones, which not only makes it more hollow, so it's a lot lighter and they can take off a lot easier, but it allows them to have more structural support than having just kind of a haphazard design. Triangles are probably one of your best friends when it comes to architecture, and that's very clearly evident in animals too. And arguably, humans figured that out because they were looking at animals for these ideas. Now, bone cells are going to be there to secrete this hard extracellular matrix that is going to be consistent of collagen and all those minerals that calcium like we talked about. 
And this collagen protein is going to add flexibility while the minerals are going to add the hardiness as well as that rigidity. So that way you can actually put weight on those bones. You'd be amazed how strong your bones are um, and the amount of force that it takes to break them, which is why we don't break them constantly, right? Uh, another main uh, priority of your bones that we've talked about a little bit is that they're there for producing the new blood cells. So in this marrow cavity, it's going to be occupying the center of the bone shaft, and you've got red bone marrow, yellow, and yellow bone marrow. The red bone marrow is there for a nursery for red blood cells and platelets. So that's going to be the main part of that connective tissue that sits inside of your blood vessels and moves things around. And those platelets are there too in case you damage that tissue to be able to quickly fix it. Then you have that yellow bone marrow, which is there to replace red bone marrow in adult limbs. And it's also there to, um, it's almost like a stem bone marrow, if you will. It's there to be ready to like quickly replace the red bone marrow. Well, if, especially if, for instance, if you like break your arm, it's going to kind of move some of that yellow bone marrow into the red bone marrow so you can start building back from the bone itself there in the center. The bones are also going to contain a wide variety of nerves and blood vessels. These bones are living organisms. They have canals located throughout them that house these veins and arteries and nerves. And there are particular ones, particularly the ones on your legs, where you've got major arteries that run through them or next to them, that major breaks in those arteries or in those bones can cause major breaks in those arteries and potentially kill you. The femoral artery in particular, if you break that connection, you can bleed out in as little as 30 seconds. So just some things to think about. Now there are two different kinds of bone tissue itself. Obviously we talked about the marrow cavity, which is surrounded by a layer of light, spongy material they call the bone marrow itself. Uh, but then we have that compact bone, which is hard and dense and forms that outer coat. It's gonna be that more there for the protection and for those attachment points. Now, the other thing that bone contains is also something called cartilage. Cartilage is fairly common in the human body. Everything from your ears are made of it to your nose structure, to your hair, to your toenails and fingernails, all that kind of stuff is made of cartilage. Um, and for instance, things like the horn on a rhinoceros is also made from cartilage. So just for shout out there, um, it doesn't really do anything if you just eat some sort of concoction of rhino horn. I doubt I have to tell you all that, but it's one of the main reasons they're all dying. So I figure I may as well go throw it out there. Um, so besides bone, that cartilage is there as the main connective tissue in the skeleton. And it's going to be there for covering the ends of bones as well as consists of mostly these tough elastic proteins, which is going to protect the end of that bone as well as allow it to move a little bit more freely. It's kind of like the WD-40 in a, a, like some sort of mechanical part. It's going to protect the actual part itself from rubbing up against it, itself as well as provide a little bit more lubrication there. This cartilage is going to help resist breakage and stretching, and even when bearing great weight, acts as an excellent shock absorber. If you think about it, and it's one of the reasons why we haven't gotten very far with robots, is jumping down from there to there does incredible amounts of damage because you're moving something about 300, 400, or up to, upwards of 300, 400 pounds and hitting that ground, right? That shock of moving just that little bit of a distance will shatter a lot of things. So you need that cartilage and that bone to work together to not only brace yourself so you don't hurt yourself, but uh, you know be able to jump and keep going. That's why if you've ever seen like walking robots, they have a very weird look to them. That's because we don't have the materials that are quite as amazing as your cartilage and your bones are as far as supporting something, as well as protecting something if it falls or breaks. So ultimately, all of your skeleton is going to begin as cartilage. So bone tissue is going to replace that cartilage as, your, as the fetus develops. And ultimately, you're going to have bone that's going to continue to grow and develop after birth. Um, how many of y'all have ever seen like a, a kid right after, as they come out of the birth canal, that particularly the head? It looks really fucking weird. Um, have you ever heard like the term cone head before? That's usually when you're going to see that because basically what's happened is all those bone plates that are inside of the skull haven't properly fused yet because it's to allow that baby to be able to get out of the birth canal. So that way it can pass a little bit easier. If you don't have that, uh, C-section is probably in your future, um, which is definitely not much more pleasant either. Um, 
But ultimately, you can actually see where when you start with this cartilage model, it becomes more and more calcified. Ultimately, by the time you're newborn, you have this kind of nice, well developed bone region in the center, but all the outsides are primarily cartilage. And slowly, more and more of that is going to become bone, ultimately, to where we get to this like determined size, right? Humans don't have um, continuous growth, right? We don't just keep growing for our entire lives. There's a determined point where we just stop growing. And that's usually where our bones can no longer grow. And all of that's controlled by genes, it's controlled by the proteins that are floating around in your body and a lot of other different things. Now where bone meets bone is gonna be called a joint. So the joint is an area where these two bones meet together or it's an area that usually allows for movement. These bones are often surrounded by fluid filled capsules of fibrous connective tissue that allow these bones to move against each other without friction. And that's really important because if you think about it, what is um, arthritis? It's where your bones are sitting and rubbing against each other. So over time, or sometimes not over time, depending on how the cause, arthritis will, is, the, is the loss of all of this tissue right here to where the bones are not rubbing on top of each other. And that's where all that pain is coming from. Because that bone is just not designed to move without that friction. You then have tendons and ligaments, which is they're going to be around those areas and form kind of the structural support at that movement site. But they're still flexible, so that way you can keep moving. Um, tendons are these tough bands of connective tissue that attack or that directly attach bone to muscle. Whereas ligaments are where they're attaching bone to bone. So, I mean, if you follow sports at all, you've probably heard of an ACL tear. It's the anterior cruciatus ligament. So it's connecting what? Bone to bone, right? Yeah, so he asked why there's no tendons being shown on the diagram. It's just not showing you where the tendon would be attached to another muscle on it. So I'm sure there are other ones that may show something similar, but that will have the tendons incorporated as well. But yeah, it's, it's just not just shown on that diagram. For, it's easier to simplify things a little bit sometimes. And like we mentioned earlier, bones are there to help regulate calcium homeostasis. So under the control of hormones, bones are going to maintain this calcium homeostasis by constantly shutting, uh, moving sh uh, calcium from bone to blood, depending on the circumstance. Now, over time, if you lose too much of this calcium, it can lead to something called osteoporosis. Porous means holes, right? So porous bones, that's where that's coming from. It's because they've lost a lot of the calcium and it makes them a little bit more brittle and more likely to break. And you particularly see this with women that are, or biological women that are usually past the age of 40 to 50. Now this calcium is vital for muscle contraction, as well as things like blood clotting and the activity of certain enzymes. And so without it, you're just not going to function, right? And so if you don't, if you lose too much of it, that's where you get osteoporosis, like we mentioned earlier, which is going to cause that weakening in those bones. So quick review question here. A painful condition called tennis elbow is caused by the inflammation of the tissue that connects the muscle to the arm bone. Therefore, tennis elbow reflects a problem with what? Either a joint, ligament, tendon, muscle fiber, or bone. It's pretty straightforward, right? If we're talking about a situation where you're connecting a muscle to an arm bone, immediately going to rule out joint as well as ligament. We're not talking about the muscle fiber or bone that's kind of there to distract you. So clearly the answer is tendon, which is literally defined as the thing that connects the muscle to an arm or to a bone, right? Pretty straightforward. Now these muscle movements are controlled by proteins as well as ATP. So as we've seen, the movements rely on interaction between bones and muscles, right? So obviously the bones are important, but the muscles are incredibly important as well. And these muscles generate movements using contractile proteins called actin and myosin. And each of these contractions are powered by the energy generated from ATP. So like I said, we're not gonna be talking, you're not gonna have to know, you know, how exactly cellular respiration works in most of these exams from now on, right? But it all comes back. It all comes back here at some point. Now, the muscles have a bunch of different functions as well, similar to bones and pretty much everything else. 
Uh, human muscular system includes more than 600 different skeletal muscles, uh, which carry out various functions of addition to voluntary movement. So you have a couple of different types here, um, and it has a different function depending on what kind of thing you're looking at. Uh, smooth and cardiac muscles are involuntary and not typically part of the considered part of the muscular system. So it's kind of fun. And this is pretty the muscular system pretty much only includes the things that are primarily going to be there for voluntary movement. So uh, some classic functions include things like voluntary movement, just you know, moving around your arms, your legs, interacting with the, the world around you. Control of bodily opening, so opening your mouth, opening your rectum, all that kind of fun stuff counts as well. Uh, the muscles that are there to maintain your posture. You're not actively thinking about as you're standing or as you're sitting, how your body is placed in that space, right? That's something that your, your muscles are controlling kind of automatically, as well as communication and down to simple things like maintaining body temperature. When you're shivering because it's cold, it's your muscles that are trying to generate heat so that way you can maintain that higher body temperature than your, the, the surroundings of you, or the, yeah, the environment around you. Now, several different types of tissue, again, make up the muscular system. And again, they kind of fall into that connective muscle and nervous categories. Um, when it comes to the muscular, uh, so the muscular system, those connective tissues are going to be there to make up tendons, which are going to attach muscles to bones, as well as surrounding muscle cells and bundles of whole muscles. Then you're going to have muscle tissue there, which is going to be there to connect bones and soft tissues. And that's going to be the primary thing driving that enabling your movement. And finally, the nervous system where you're going to have to sense that body position and control the muscles depending on where you want your arm to be or where you want your leg to be, that kind of thing. Now, muscles often work in pairs. It's kind of like when we were talking about the endocrine system, you have one to upregulate things and one to downregulate things, right? Very, very similar in your muscular system. So throughout the skeletal muscles, sets of antagonistic muscle pairs work together to generate back and forth motion. For instance, you've got your biceps, which you're going to contract and move your arm forward. And you've got your triceps, which are down here, are going to contract and relax your muscle, your biceps. Those two things work together to move those, uh, your arm at once. And ultimately, all these different muscles move together so that way you can you know, do this number as much as you want. Thing is, though, muscles have a hierarchical organization. So, a muscle is an organ enclosed in connective tissue. Nourished by blood vessels and controlled by nerves. And you can actually see this kind of breakdown. You start with these thick myosin filaments that are at the center of things. Those form into these myofibrils, which ultimately form into these sarcomeres. If you put them all together, you can generate a much larger piece. And then you generate a much larger piece of tissue, which is this muscle fiber. Then you can put all these muscle fibers together. You can actually have a bundle of muscle fibers. And then you're going to combine all those bundles of muscle fibers together and actually get a whole muscle construction. It's, it's very much like, you know, the cell to the um, tissue to the organ, that kind of structure, you see it on a much smaller scale here in the muscle. So each muscle contains something called a muscle fiber, which is the individual muscle cell with highly specialized structure. And these bundles of muscle fibers make up a muscle itself. Now, these muscle cells contain many things called myofibrils, which are made of thick and thin filaments. These myofibrils are made up of filamentous contractile proteins, actin and myosin. So you've got a thin filament called actin and a thick filament called myosin. And how they move is going to be greatly dependent on where these filaments are, as well as how many of them you have in the cellular cell. Each long myofibril is divided into two chunks, or functional units called sarcomeres. So for instance, here's a myofibril. If we just were to look at this section here, it's just the sarcomere. Then you've got that myosin and that actin, that are those filaments that are inside it. Does that make sense? This is something you're going to be kind of careful to make sure you're keeping very distinct in your head, as you'll get tripped up on this occasionally. Ultimately, actin and myosin slide past each other. So the, according to the sliding filament model, which is our best guess of how muscles actually work, a muscle cell contracts when a thin filament slides between thicker ones. And these interactions are the basis of the classic muscle movement. Again, while we have a pretty good idea of how these things exactly happen, we don't always have 100% of the story. So there may be parts of this that are missing, depending on the type of organism, as well as you know, how different things like 
uh, muscle degenerative dis uh, disorders and things like that might affect those kinds of tissues. So another quick review question here. If you arrange the following items in order from largest to smallest, which of them is third on the list? This one's kind of a pain, but it's myofibril. And we're kind of running out on time, so I have to kind of pick up this pace here a little bit. So when muscle cells contract, the sarcomeres are going to become shorter. Um, that motion that occurs as the contractile protein site packs each other shortens each sarcomere without changing the length of the thicker tip tendon filaments. Basically, because they're sliding past each other in different directions, it's kind of almost like a drawstring bag, if you will, where it's going to close something without actually like changing the length of the cord. Now, ultimately, actin and myosin are not going to interact when you've got a resting muscle. So here in step one, actin and myosin are filaments near each other but not touching. These myosins are going to have binding type on the actin are exposed. So when those nerves stimulate the actin and myosin, something happens. That muscle cell is going to receive that impulse from a nervous system, right? And the myosin is going to bind to the actin, forming cross here. here. And that's where you're going to have to have that ATP to generate that connection. Those cross bridges are then going to change shape from straight to bent. And this is what's actually moving those two filaments across without, it, it basically as those filaments come together for those cross bridges, that bending in those cross bridges is what's going to slide those filaments. They're both sitting like here. When those cross bridges form, they're just going to slide out like that. And then again, this ATP is what makes that sliding motion possible. Now ATP comes in here at step four and it's going to bind to those cross bridges which is going to cause them to separate and those, uh, from those active binding sites. So in other words, it's going to separate those myo, uh, the, uh, sorry, the words are speaking to me, uh, the actin and the myosin from each other at that point. And ultimately in step five here, you're going to have the hydrolysis of the ATP, which is going to provide the energy to return back to the myosin to its straight conformation. Don't worry about this too much. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the quiz, but just know that this is a general process. Ultimately, when actin and myosin return to that resting state, they're going to um, readily bind to actin again once they get that stimulation again. So, in other words, it's just this constant process of, you know, the electrical stimulation that's going to tell them to bind and create those bridges. Those bridges are going to get bent. Then you have to use ATP to break those bridges and then release it back to the way it was. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of neurons that are going to stimulate these things, specifically the motor neurons, which are going to be there to stimulate contraction. So motor neurons are going to send those impulses from the central nervous system to the muscle cells, causing them to contract. Now, one motor neuron is typically a synapses with several muscle cells, forming motor units that all contract together. So in other words, you don't have to send a bunch of signals out to one single cell. You can send a single uh, signal down to a motor unit and that controls all of them together. Just as a reminder, with nerve cells, right? That synapse that's there is it what's actually sending that information. That synapse is just a space in between where that nerve interface is with the muscle or nerve to nerve. Now, neurons are going to signal those muscles across the synapse. So the signal to contract is transmitted across the synapses between those motor neurons um, and the actual muscle cell. And those neurotransmitters are what are actually traveling through that synapse and telling the, those uh, muscle cells to contract by moving into those open ion channels. Now, calcium ions in particular are going to allow actin and myosin to interact. So those neurotransmitters are going to cause the opening of an ion channel in the muscle cell. It's going to release the accumulation of these calcium ions into the cytosol here, down here in the actual muscle cell. So those calcium ions are then going to change the shape of the thin filaments, allowing those myosin's heads to bind on actin and kind of go through that whole process like we did detailed a minute ago. Now, motor units can vary in size dramatically. So obviously, you could be controlling just a couple of small, tiny muscles. Particularly, say the muscles in your face are usually going to be a little more refined because you have a lot more muscle movements that you need to generate. Particularly humans compared to other organisms, we have a lot more of this hyper-focus in 
these small muscle uh, motor function, you know, functional units, because we need to be able to emote emotion, right? There's a big difference between a smile and a frown. All that's controlled by very minute changes and like grouping those motor units together. Whereas when you're talking about something like the arm, you're going to be controlling a much larger motor unit just because it's simply just an up down movement, right? A little bit different. So a motor unit consisting of hundreds of muscle cells is going to produce large, large coarse movements like our arm, like I just mentioned, and those that are required to for instance, throw a ball, right? You're gonna need those large, more powerful movements all at once. Whereas more, the more smaller motor units are gonna be something in things like your face or your eye movements or something like that, where you don't need a huge movement all at once. You need these small, very slight movements at very small times. So the more motor units activated, the stronger the force of the contraction. So for instance, with our arms and our legs, right? We're moving a lot of muscle all at once. And that's why, it's a lot more of a forceful movement to move your arm than it is to say move something like your eyes or something like that. So another quick question here. Uh, we'll skip it. We're kind of running low on time here. Uh, ultimately, muscle cells have several ways to produce ATP. Obviously, ATP is generated in aerobic respiration during muscle, regular muscle activity. So muscle cells can produce their own ATP just as aerobic, aerobically. But ATP can also be directly replenished with the help of a molecule called fox, or creatine phosphate, which is again going to help you move that ATP around your body. This is often one of the things that you might see as some sort of supplement powder. Then you're going to have, um, when that creatine phosphate supply is depleted, aerobic respiration is going to continue producing ATP as long as the muscle is receiving enough oxygen. And then um, once you lost that excess oxygen, the cells are going to switch to fermentation which is again, that anaerobic pathway for respiration. And so you can still build up that ATP, but when it gets to that point, that's where you're gonna start generating something called lactic acid as a byproduct. And that lactic acid is usually what causes a lot of the soreness in your muscles when you're like run for a long time or anything like that. Now there are ultimately two types of muscle fibers. You can have slow twitch and back switch. Slow twitch are usually small and use energy slowly and have high endurance. Whereas fast switch are usually fibers that are there for large, but quick bursts of energy and tire very quickly. So it's the difference between running and doing something like weightlifting. And often these things are intermeshed together. So that way you have a bunch of these different kinds of fibers inside of your body. And like say, for instance, you have both of these in your legs right now, right? But then in how you train your body and how which muscles you kind of use more regularly, you're more likely to have better developed slow twitch fibers and fast twitch fibers, right? So if you're more of a runner and constantly going out for more aerobic activity, whereas if you're more of a weightlifter, you're going to be more likely to develop those fast switch fibers that are in your legs as well. So the proportion of these muscle fibers influences your athletic performance. So not only is it the size of those fibers, but how many oftentimes by using them in a lot of very repetitive functions. So say for instance, if you run consistently for like a month or two, you're gonna start building up more and more of those slow twitch fibers. Whereas if you're lifting a lot of weights, you're more likely to build up the opposite. The athletes with higher proportion of fast twitch fibers are gonna perform best at short and fast events. Whereas athletes that are, have more of those slow twitch fibers are gonna excel at endurance sports. And obviously you have to have a little bit of both for these things to really do well in the first place, right? So the proportion of these muscle fibers is often influenced by genetics and exercise. So yes, you can change these things through exercise, but you only have so much room to work with. There's only so much, you know, the body plan that your body can pull from to grow and develop these things. Now genes are ultimately gonna determine those fast switch and slow switch ratio, but it is possible to alter this ratio through extensive exercise. Um, and this exercise is specifically the size of those muscles, the efficiency of the muscle cell um, metabolism, the blood flow to the muscles, and the uh, actual bone strength itself. So how exactly do athletes build this muscle? See, regular exercise, which increases that muscle mass itself, which then comes from the growth of individual muscle cells rather than from an increase in number. A trained athlete's muscle fibers is going to use energy much more efficiently than those of somebody who, like me, just kind of sits around all day and has to work on a computer the whole time. Uh, muscles can degenerate from lack of use. 
So if you've sat around a lot more often recently than you used to say a year ago, pre-COVID, you're much more likely to have lost some of that muscle mass, right? And ultimately, without regular exercise, the mitochondrial activity does drop. Your aerobic respiration efficiency falls uh, by even as much as 50%, which is crazy if you think about it. And the blood vessels that are going to bring them less oxygen. So let's skip that. Uh, we'll go ahead and do it. So say, for instance, an athlete supplements her diet with creatine phosphate. How might this improve their athletic performance? A, she might have more, competi or more competitive and long triathlons. B, she might be able to run a marathon much more quickly. C, she might be able to sprint for slightly longer. Or D, more than one of these choices is correct. I'll give you all a second to think about it. <clears throat> so think about creatine phosphate and that whole arc, or, you know, explanation of where ATP comes from. Remember, you start with just regular ATP that's being produced in the muscle cell through aerobic respiration. Then you go to the creatine phosphate, which is just storing that ATP. Then your ATP, that whatever can be generated as you're actively using that muscle. Then finally, the anaerobic respiration. So think about that structure. How many of y'all think it's A? B? C? C? It's C. And the reason that it is, is it's going to increase her endurance, right? It's going to give her a little bit longer that she continues to use that ATP. But it's not going to give you that overwhelming strength. It's going to be kind of somewhere in the middle. It's going to give you a little bit of a boost, but it's not enough to just continuously supply things over and over and over again. That's why it's C and not A. It makes a little bit more sense. All right. So as always, remember quiz five is due on Sunday, connecting with biology is due on Monday, and exam two is coming up. You need to be studying for this or you will not do well.